felt like dry heaving except for everything was closed up and I couldn't dry heave. Some people did throw up. Let's start with a story. Hmm. Approximately one million years ago, this November, I finished basic training for the Army. A key event in basic training is called the gas chamber. In the gas chamber, you go in and they expose you to tear gas. It's memorable. So for the gas chamber, what you do is you go in, you have your group of people, and everyone goes in, hand on the shoulder, person in front of you, you have your gas mask on, and you go in there, they, they shut the doors and they're metal locks, like chunk, chunk, and you can't escape. So we go in there and we have our masks on, right? And we move our head side to side and up and down, and make sure the seal's good and it's like, no problem. So then they have us take off our masks and take a couple deep breaths. And for a split second of, of naive optimism, I thought, eh, that's not so bad. It's a little stingy, but not bad at all. Then it hit. It was like a bunch of burning hands, burning, stinging hands, just grabbing my stomach and esophagus and my throat and my lungs and just squeezing as tight as I possibly could. And my skin was on fire and I just felt like dry heaving, except for everything was closed up and I couldn't dry heave. Some people did throw up, okay? I did not, but some people never did. Had, I've never had respiratory problems, but I imagine that's what an asthma attack would be like. It was horrible. I, mean, I could tell I was drooling and then they have us put our masks back on and I couldn't get a seal on the mask because there was so much snot and drool just pouring like the world's stupidest waterfall out of my nose, out of my mouth. So I'm trying to get the mask on and I'm like, Aah! finally get it on. And after you get your mask on, you what you do is you cover the filter and you blow out. You clear the bad air out. That's what you're supposed to do when you get a gas mask on. But everything's all closed up. So it's like, I think that they, when we had the masks off, they had to say a few things, but I don't really remember. I was kind of distracted by the fact that I could not breathe. But either way, so when it was time to finally leave the gas chamber, we had to all line up again, no masks on, hold our masks up, put our hands on the shoulder of the person in front of us, and we had to go out together. Man, we just book it. And it was just burning. We just snot and spit and everything just dribbling down and our skin was on fire. It was memorable. And then when we did field exercise later on in training, they would throw the they would throw tear gas at us and we'd get out our masks and put it on and stuff like that to get the habit of doing that quickly because man, tear gas sucks. I also want to note that I have healthy lungs. I've never had respiratory problems, and it sucked for me. Everything was closing up and just... It was horrible. Now, you may be wondering what this has to do with chemistry or physics, or you may have forgotten that you were watching a science video in the first place. Let me explain. Interestingly, CS gas is not a gas. It's a colloid. What is a colloid, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you. A colloid is a type of mixture with particles of what? One substance, one substance. A colloid is a type of mixture with particles of one substance dispersed through a second substance. It's between a solution and a suspension. In a solution, you can think of it like a chocolate chip cookie. You have a solvent and a solute. A solute is whatever you mix in there, small amounts of stuff. And that's your chocolate chips. The solvent is what dissolves it or surrounds it. That's your cookie dough. A good example of a solution is when you have water mixed with drink mix. Your drink mix is your solute, what you put into something else, and your water is your solvent. Solvent is what dissolves something else. So you can see it dissolves it, or at least it should. And you can see the spoon easily in there. It dissolves the mix and creates a drink. In a suspension, you have larger particles that eventually settle because of their size. An example of this is dirt in water. Sand in water is also a good example, but I don't have any sand. So here's some dirt. I'm gonna put it in my water. you can see that most of the dirt has settled to the bottom. 
In a colloid, you would think of your chocolate chips as your dispersed phase. That's what we call the little pieces of stuff that are mixed in something else. And the stuff it's mixed in is called the dispersion medium. So your dough is the dispersion medium and your chocolate chips are the dispersed phase. Is it, mm, I'm gonna eat it. When I nod at you. Okay. Milk is a liquid dispersed in a liquid. You can see when I shine a flashlight at it, that it scatters the light. That's one of the features of a colloid is that the light is scattered. Mmm. First in a gas. It's a kind of foam. Let's try that again. It's a gas. It's fine. First in a liquid. Whipped cream is a colloid. It's a kind of foam. It's a gas dispersed in a liquid. Yes. Jelly is a liquid dispersed in a solid. Shaving cream is another kind of foam. It's a gas dispersed in a liquid. I'm not eating this. Oh no! Clouds and fog and mists are liquids dispersed in gas. Of course, the day I decided to film is probably the clearest day we've had in weeks. Oh look, the clouds! Smoke is a solid dispersed in a gas. The main component in tear gas is 2-chlorobenzylmalononitrile. Yes, I practiced it. And since that's a, pretty much a mouthful, we call it CS gas. The intersection recovered a spent canister labeled CS, a substance commonly known as tear gas. CS gas has the chemical formula C10H5ClN2. That's an L, not an I. Here is a diagram of the chemical structure. That's shorthand for this big thing. You can see in chemists are very lazy, so we try to abbreviate things as much as possible. So we don't write the carbons or the hydrogens, but that's what the structure of this molecule looks like. Like some other colloids, CS is a solid dispersed in a gas. When CS is combined with a gas and is put under pressure, it becomes an aerosol. When the aerosol is released, that CS becomes like a powdered barb. If you can think of really tiny barbed wire going everywhere and all of your, it sticks in your mucous membranes because that's easiest for particles to stick to. It's, that's what you're, that's why you have mucus and stuff like that is to catch all of the stuff. These are just examples to give you an idea of what it might look like. These tiny little barbs attach to moist mucous membranes and cause irritation, to put it mildly. This means that the most vulnerable areas are the respiratory system and the eyes, but exposed to skin is also going to get irritated as well. I can tell you, when my experience with tear gas, it felt like my skin was on fire. You can see how using tear gas would be effective against someone who was rioting or looting, or a big group of people who were committing crimes. That would be an effective way to disperse the situation. It causes confusion, it causes shortness of breath, it makes you want to leave, okay? However, one thing that needs to be considered is, what about peaceful protesters? If you're a peaceful protester, should you be exposed to tear gas? I mean, within your constitutional rights. A park police SWAT team officer crouches down to roll a chemical grenade toward the protesters. Another tear gas bomb right at our feet. We're gonna move back from this right now. There is little human data on vulnerable populations when it comes to exposure to tear gas. Also, let's keep in mind that a lot of irritation to your respiratory system could leave you susceptible to possibly make it easier to contract viruses. When there's a certain pandemic going on, that's even worse. If you have any respiratory problems and you're exposed to tear gas, please seek help immediately. Otherwise, you gotta kind of walk it off, get fresh air, give it time, it usually subsides in about 30 minutes, and then you wanna rinse off with water. Now, remember when you're rinsing off your eyes with water, don't go like this and just pour over the top and just cascade down. I mean, that'll be like when you put sunscreen um, on your forehead and then you start sweating and it gets in your eyes only if the sunscreen were made of lava. So what you want to do is turn your head sideways and you rinse off, start in the corner of your eye, rinse it that way, turn the other way, water it there, rinse it that way. That's the best way to rinse out your eyes. And of course you'll want to take a shower, wash any clothes you were wearing, because, yeah, no bueno. Here's where the science explanation kind of slows down and my own opinion kind of takes over. For people who are rioting, looting, and hurting other people or destroying property, I can see tear gas as being a good solution. 
However, when people are peacefully protesting and within their constitutional rights, I don't personally don't think it should be used. I don't think you should be afraid to peacefully protest. Just make sure you're not rioting and looting. Obviously, no duh, don't break the law. I think that no matter what your respiratory conditions are, you should be allowed to peacefully protest. As long as you're peacefully protesting, you're within your rights, and I don't think that you should have to worry about tear gas causing problems. Gassed and shoved. Head down, keep moving. Another personal opinion of mine is I've seen people on social media making fun of peaceful protesters when they get tear gassed. They couldn't handle it. Well, if you're making fun of people who are within their constitutional rights, I think that you should ease off. But. Take care, y'all.